introduction to uh, Lizzie, our company. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about what we do uh, and then tell you a little bit about the challenge and what we expect. And after me, uh, Daniel will share some experiences uh, uh, when working on the project. Um, so without further ado, let's start. Tell me when you see my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Great. So, we are lazy. Um, um, We are Lizzy, um, um, a Gen AI Israeli startup. We build a secure, multimodal, flexible, generative AI platform optimized for legal workflow, meaning a platform for lawyers and law firms. Um, we build uh, a platform that is aiming at being the one place where law firms and lawyers and legal teams will use all their generative AI work with respect to legal. There's a bunch of legal workflows that needs optimization, and that's uh, um, our expertise. Um, we have a, a, a team of eight people. Um, I think the most interesting thing about our team is that five are in Israel, but three are in Addis Ababa. Uh, we care very much about uh working with the uh, people in uh, ethiopia uh we think it's a very uh, uh good market potential uh we're very happy with the opportunity and we invest a lot of efforts and energy to maintain presence in in, in ethiopia and work with ethiopian people uh we believe in you guys uh we're uh, three founders in the team i come from a legal background but i spent the last 20 years in startups i led uh, two startups uh, that were sold one to microsoft one to intel worked for a few years in microsoft and in intel and about a year ago started lizzie netzer is our cto the best technologies you've ever seen uh, it's really uh, deep and broad and uh, very experienced um, really really strong guy uh, he uh, used to be my CTO in previous startups and also started a company of his own uh, a few years back. He was one of the first that actually uh, built a uh, desktop virtualization system. He built beautiful technology. And Chai is our NLP expert, uh, an AI expert, has a lot of years of experience uh, in various types of, uh, uh, of AI, NLP and also Gen AI, of course. You know uh, uh, probably about Gen AI as much as I do, but in a very high level, the two very big trends I want to uh, uh, show is one, Gen AI in legal is crazy. What we see here is GPT-4 taking the U.S. bar exams. The U.S. bar exams is the uh, exams that lawyers need to take to get a license, doing better than the average person, the average lawyer. And what's more interesting is the evolution of models. So these are uh, uh, weakest, weaker models of GPT, of OpenAI, over one year. So in one year, we improved from 10%, from the uh, 10 percentile to the 80th percentile. Um, and that's the main thing that also reflected here. The pace of evolution, uh, the increase in quality is tremendous. We are here in 24. It feels like we're experienced. Is that? my connection or i don't think so 
Let's just start on my side. So yeah, we, uh, I think uh, he has traveled in internet connection. I have uh, written to him, so he will be back yeah. soon, uh, I guess. Let, let us sure, wait no? him uh, a minute. Yeah. No, great. Um, normally it happens from our side more than, and when it happens hmm. in the other side, it, you, you have to check, yeah. Sorry guys, where did you lose me? Daniel, help me. How much time ago was that? Uh, it was around uh, two minutes ago, I guess. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry guys. Think, and when you were showing the LLM uh, yeah. uh, scaling, like for the US bar exam. Okay. On the bar graphs. Yeah. Let me get back to this. Um, so uh, did you uh, did you hear what I have to say on this slide? I think so. Uh, so. I think yeah. uh, okay. we, we heard about the evolution. Cool. Um, so um, um, we build a platform that works with web experience like ChatGPT and with uh, client experience, which is integrated with Word documents. Lawyers work a lot with the uh, uh, Word documents. Uh, this is like a co-pilot experience, and we focus on legal workflows. Um, we provide a secure platform, a multi-model platform, and focus again on legal workflows. What are legal workflows? Uh, legal workflows are uh, a set of actions that you do when you uh, do legal work. It could be various things, uh, um, legal questions and answers. That's the uh, 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 the essence of our challenge. Uh, proofreading, summarizing, translation, uh, review contracts, create contract, create other documents, litigation documents, extract data for trial, find evidence, and things like that. Uh, there's a lot of uh, action in the legal space. Um, um, there's a lot of business. Um, uh, there's a lot of competition. So here you see uh, the space with uh, 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 the Y axis is, is LLM generative AI versus legacy AI. And the X is less flexible versus more flex flexible. These are the main names that compete in the industry and the way we differentiate ourselves is that we build a platform. There's a lot of law firms that are building a homegrown solution. Um, these guys are providing very closed systems 
we try to build a platform that will be more flexible, that will be much cheaper to build than to build this one, but can be flexible. They can use whatever model they want. They can implement their own workload very easily. And that's our main edge. Let's talk about uh, the challenge. So uh, the challenge is building a, a contract Q&A system based on RAG. Um, what is uh, the contract Q&A that uh, we envision or that we're building? Um, it's a system that enables you to ask anything about the contract, either to upload the contract. This is what you see here is a client that sits on top of Word, but you can also upload it into a web chat. I will show you in a second. It's supported by web and the word add-in. It supports a chat experience and it supports multiple contracts. Um, why use RAG? So there's a very big debate these days um, between um, uh, RAG and uh, long context LLM. It seems like LLM are getting longer and longer context, and a lot of people uh, think or say that uh, uh, this may solve the RAG uh, issue. Still, it's not completely accurate because uh, uh, even with long context, so we're struggling. Uh, long context is not working good, so if I throw in contracts, uh, even for uh, Google Gemini, which supports 2 million uh, token uh, context window. Uh, I, I, I throw in long documents of hundreds of pages. It doesn't work well enough. Um, um, and it takes a long time. Um, so with RAG, you can um, support multiple documents. 100, 50, and even two or three or four may work better and faster. It's more accurate and much, much cheaper. It's very expensive to send traffic to an LLM uh, if you're talking hundreds of pages. Uh, much, much, much cheaper to do it uh, over RAG. Uh, still, I'm not sure how the future will look like. My expectation is that RAG will be used mainly uh, to search in very large database of documents. So if you need to uh, Q&A uh, one, two, or three contracts within a year from now, I think this will be done without RAG. But if you want to uh, search uh, for information inside a big database of thousands, and sometimes millions of uh, documents, you will need RAG. What do we expect on the challenge? Um, so a basic implementation that will be good enough is uh, for people that will implement the basic uh, uh, RAG flow. Um, uh, pull evaluation in place, build some kind of uh, an evaluation system and be able to analyze and evaluate what they did and suggest uh, uh, solid enhancements. So we put in the challenge a lot of documentation, a lot of uh, information and tutorial, and it's relatively easy to build a basic rug, but then you need to improve it. Um, and I'm looking for the good implementation for ideas, how to improve it. Solid ideas, not just throwing a bunch of them, but thinking of one or two that you would say, hey, this is what I would do, and this is why. A better uh, implementation uh, um, um, is for people that ably, uh, actually were able to play with various chunking strategies. Uh, chunking influences RAG uh, significantly. Uh, find the optimal chunking strategy and explain what they did and why. Um, and a great implementation will actually implement another improvement, whatever you think is the right improvement on top of that. Uh, I see that uh, in this challenge, uh, uh, 10 Academy uh, also uh, an agent, so it will be really, really cool if People have a good uh, idea of how to uh, implement uh, an, an autogen agent uh, in this flow. And this would be, in my mind, a great implementation. We look for very deep understanding, quality. Uh, we prefer quality over quantity. And we want to see something that works. 
these are the things that we put focus on. Um, let me uh, ask, uh, 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 let me open this discussion for questions. Actually, you know what? One more thing. Let me show you a quick demo and then I'll let you ask some questions before we move to Daniel. Do you still see, see my screen? Are you with me, guys? Yes. Yeah, now I we can see us. So this is uh, Lizzie, the web version. Um, let's uh, uh, throw in a document, a contract, um, and ask it a question. Um, who owns the IP? Lizzie will analyze the document, will give me uh, a citation where it took the answer from, um, and, uh, uh, and, and show me the result inside the document. Let me ask a different question uh, that will uh, show it better. Uh, what is the term of the agreement? So it analyzed fetch the term of the agreement. If I click here, it shows me where it is inside the contract. Um, so I can verify that's one of the advantages of RAG that you fetch in uh, information and you can show where you found the relevant information. Now I'm happy to uh, open this for questions. Any questions, guys and girls? Yabi, do you want to add maybe something about uh, uh, the agent implementation? Or uh, would um, you have to it correctly? I mean, yeah, I, I think it's the, the key component, of course, is, I mean, we introduced it as part of one of the additions. Like, you know, in, in the previous challenge, we had like add-ons like that they can improve. And this is just as one suggestion. And I think, the, you know, the main reason a lot more about the adding uh, agents is to be able first is to to compare the performance when um, in, improve maybe the quality of it. So sometimes it if it needs to iterate without asking, but actually break down some strategies, then it will hopefully improve. So in a way, instead of just answering a simple rag, just saying, okay, here is the document within that document. You know, here is the information I get, and if the information is not available in that in that part, okay, I, I will answer. I have I didn't find um, you know the information, for example, in the document. Instead of that, maybe just being able to plan first, ex and then do checks. For example, a, a strategy whether the relevant information is available, um, and then if so, you know how to execute it. If there is confusion, for example, improve it within it of course it would increase the cost slightly but the main idea was to be able to open up some form of planning um, and then handling that execution through the basically agents are a natural way of that so just to open more than just one you know defining the strategy instead of in one or you know like predefined prompts so there is also another strategy where you actually break down the, the problem, especially for the easy ones, it's easy, but for slightly tricky and more connected ones. So that's that's the main reason why the twist on, on agents um, to see also whether there is an actual clear improvement doing that in, in that way. So, I mean, just that's a motivation for that. Okay, um, if, if I, I, I don't think it's going to be uh, very easy to uh, add an effective agent flow to the Q&A flow with this uh, uh, structure that we have because um, yes. it, may, it may be very effective if you are, you know, searching the web and you can have an agent that will run and search uh, in various places. 
um, here to do something nice you probably need to think of something more sophisticated so I think it's challenging but very interesting yeah. Yeah, I mean, another element, a lot more for me, just the, the key component maybe in just is, one is different contracts have different layouts and being able to determine, for example, to infer first the type of contracts that is uploaded and to basically one of the key advantage of um, uh, agents are skills. So you can build different type of skills for these agents to handle so basically based on inference for example for a certain type of contracts you know for a long contract versus short contract right or for a contract of this type or that type you can build different skills and being able to i mean the skills basically are prompts um, um that a worker executes right and and so again of course this is a very short time it is Definitely, it's a much more of like, I think, in the spirit of the, the challenge are that people explore and some people might explore it more and some people might explore it less, but it is to provide that there, there is a, also an interesting paradigm for um, improving performances. So let's see the outcome. And again, I am also looking forward. I mean, I, I have seen it in a couple of other, a, a lot more of uh for a complex project especially more than q and a if it also needs to prepare documents or if it if it needs to do more like agents are usually a good way to go but in this case i agree it might be an overkill um but it's also i think it might you know it might surprise us so let's let's see okay and 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 there are a few nice things you can do with agents so um i uh, here in this flow so uh, I do expect uh, very much to see what people will do there, there are some nice things you can do I yeah, saw someone exactly. uh, raising a hand uh, but I think Wandera, Wandera raised uh, your hand so you can ask and then also I wanted to ask about agents are, are agents like tools like mm -hmm. uh, let me say you you pass a question to the LLM and then if the LLM knows the answer, it will just automatically give you the answer. But if the LLM does is not doesn't really know the answer, it will like will it go to the agents and the agent will look through, let me say, like the different tools, and then it will create an observation, then return the answer back to you. Is that how agents work? Is that the concept? That's one. That's one 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 way uh, uh, agent works. Agent is not the tool. So you have agents and you have tools. Tools are tools that the agents can use, but what makes an agent an agent is the ability to make a autonomous decision. So it's an LLM that makes decision uh, different than the normal flow yeah, that just you ask a maybe, question. Just or, maybe to add the LLM. Go on, sorry. Uh, I know. So versus just giving an instruction to the LLM and getting a, a, a response from the LLM when you're turning the NLM into an agent you give it discretion you say you know in this situation uh, I need you to decide what to do turn left or turn right do this or do that use this tool or the other tool this is what makes an LLM an agent So the LLM is basically the agent, the engine, and then every other component is a lot more using the. It's like maybe a car analogy. I'm not sure if it really applies, but the engine supplies everything for the car, and so the LLM is like that. It become it is the engine to make this. You know, for the agents to do decisions, they still consult with the LLM. And they think everything is done by the LLM for every semantic decisions, but tools and codes combine to basically, uh, are, it changed the architecture. So it changed the architecture that you can actually have a planner, an executor, you know, and, and choose different skills that apply. So it's much more, I think, as Arnon said, the LLM is there and, you have different tools 
that agents can use, but agent is architecture more um, and not just the particular tools and agents have skills. These skills usually are basically skills. When we say skills, it's type of prompts. So, but all synchronized by the engine, the LLM. There was another hand. All right. Yeah. Michael? Go ahead, Michael. Michael. Okay, maybe Michael is unable to speak, Hillary. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, that, uh, that is uh, great work on uh, looking at the demo and the presentation. So my question is, uh, on on when I did more research on improving uh, the uh, the response of generation of LLM, I came up across legal knowledge graphs, and um, so I'm asking that. Uh, do you focus on scraping the data or uh, do you have your specific document uh, content or documents that uh, that you are going to use as, as the context or can we go ahead and fine tune uh, so or you just use the base model that it is and also the second one is my second question is on the metrics or um, I would like to ask what metrics do you value most of the is it the response time uh, accuracy? I will bring it as the most important first, and then, uh, and then the others like um, how it can easily, how, can, how you can easily identify the weight, uh, the sources, and if it matches. So there are several metrics, but what will you, what would you say for them for your for the most important in your case? So to start with your first question, uh, we do uh, uh, most of the work we do is leveraging the generic uh, LLMs. So we use uh, uh, all the big names. We use GPT-4, we use Gemini, uh, we use uh, Anthropic Cloud, we use Llama, uh, we use Mixtral. Um, and one capability we have is identifying which is the right model to connect in certain circumstances. So some models are working better with longer documents, some models are working better with track changes, some models are working better uh, in certain legal areas. Uh, so that's one thing. And then we also uh, uh, implement flows so to implement the flow for example to create a contract or to review a contract um, uh, you do a lot of prompt engineering and then you implement agents on top of it so a team of uh, uh, virtual legal professionals that uh, work together and one is creating the flow in our uh, example a contract for example the other one fetched in uh, uh, experts in various uh, areas and another one verifies it so that's a lot of the work that we do and we also fine-tune models so for example daniel that we talked shortly uh, is fine-tuning uh, now uh, an anonymizer part of the flow of what we do is when we uh, upload contracts to the llm we anonymize them uh, so, for example, one thing that we're working on right now is creating a lot of synthetic data with LLM to uh, train uh, the Berda model to anonymize the contract that we upload. Um, you asked also about uh, 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 the KPIs that we target. Uh, uh, I think accuracy is probably the most important one. Uh, we also value speed very much, uh, so one of the consideration uh, where to go is uh, to, the, to go to the faster model on certain circus, uh, circumstances. Uh, speed and accuracy are the most important for us. Thank you.
Michael, do you want to um, ask something? Michael, yeah. Okay, thank you. So as we saw in the demonstration, the Lizzie chatbot is pretty good, I think. So we have limited time, like one week. So if you give us some metrics or limitations on the chatbots that you want us to improve, thank you. So um, I think, so there's a lot of things you can improve uh, with, uh, uh, with RAG. And in the documentation we've added, there's a lot of tricks and tips on a lot of things you can do. I think the main thing of the challenge is to really, first and foremost, build something that works, the basic one, and then identify uh, what's not working for you. We have a data set uh, in the challenge, uh, questions and answers. You can test them, uh, see what works, see what's not working, um, and come up with uh, interesting ideas on how to improve. There's a lot of ideas in the documentation I put. Um, my tip is to find one or two, uh, understand them well, and implement it. Jabez? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I want to ask about the chunking part. You said that uh, the chunking will have uh, much effect on the rug. It will improve it much. So. Uh, I saw different strategies for chunking, but uh, doesn't have that affect the document you upload? Is is it not subjective to the document? For example, if you chunk it uh, subjective to the document, uh, and when there is a different document that are uploaded, is that going to affect that one? It does. So the chunking strategy has a generic component. So questions, do I use big chunks, small chunks? Do I chunk paragraphs? Do I chunk more than paragraphs? Do I chunk uh, sentences? Uh, and these are generic questions for every type of document. And then there are specific uh, fields and documents that uh, maybe have a, a, a different uh, uh, behavior than the default, uh, for example, uh, contracts are built, their, their atomic units are sections. Uh, it's challenging to uh, extract uh, sections. Maybe you can do something with Word. It's harder to do this with uh, a PDF. Uh, so there's various levels you can go to. Um, um, some of them are generic and some of them are specific. And that's part of the insights. Uh, that I want to encourage you to find yourself. So I have a contract, I chunk it this way, I chunk it the other way. Uh, how does it work? What works better and why? All right, okay, yeah, shall we move to yeah. Daniel? Yes, I was just about to say, yeah, if there are no questions, then yeah, we can move to Daniel. Okay, uh, so thank you, Yavi. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for inviting us. Just, and also before, just before uh, you start, Daniel, if Arnon, at any time, if you want to drop, just of course, you are, you know, just uh, you can feel free just to say, it. Um, yeah, okay, go on. No, no, I'll, I'll stay with you. Fantastic. Okay. We'd, we'd be happy. So uh, my name is uh, Daniel Salalam, and uh, to tell you my backgrounds, uh, I was uh, I graduated from Madisaba University uh, in software engineering, and then uh, I joined uh, Ten Academy for uh, training on uh, machine learning and uh, data engineering. Uh, I think yeah, I was uh, a batch for on the batch for training program. So I just wanted to say uh, I was uh, where you are right now, and uh, I know how intense is the program. And you are on, I think, week 11 on the final uh, part of the training. And uh, uh, I I'm really confident that you had a very good experience at uh, Ten Academy. So, uh, after 
after finishing the Tin Academy program, I joined a company called Ray Labs uh, that was based on South Africa as a data engineer. And after that, uh, uh, last year I joined Lizzie. Uh, and uh, at Lizzie, I learned uh, uh, most of the, the knowledge, especially on data science and uh, generative AI. Uh, area. So most of the knowledge and the experience I have right now on the area in the area of generative AI as well as uh, LLMs were uh, from Lizzie and I learned a lot and also uh, have, I can say I have uh, grown in experience. So what I like uh, from Lizzie is that uh, it's really, if you like, uh, an environment where uh, tasks are done by researching and experimenting, this is the best place for you. Uh, most of the tasks and the projects that we are doing right now involve uh, researching, since most of them focus on generative AI, and this is a new area, and new uh, things are being published uh, frequently in this uh, area. So you have to update yourself. Uh, you have to do lots of research and also uh, do experimenting. So uh, I can describe the path of uh, product release at Lizzie in such a way. So first, there is uh, a time where, uh, which is called Lizzie Research. So whenever uh, some projects is delivered uh, into production. Before that, we do uh, we put that uh, product in uh, as a research, and uh, in that step, we do uh, lots of experimenting and evaluating to optimize uh, the products that's going to be released in. In that process, you are going to learn a lot. Uh, there are uh, very uh, smart uh, senior uh, data scientists as well as uh, software engineers uh, in our team. And uh, I learned a lot uh, from them. Uh, as, uh, and that's what I really like about Lizzie. So uh, projects uh, I was involved with, so I had uh, a, I was involved in creating uh, any projects that involved with creating evaluation pipeline uh, for the LLMs that we fine-tuned for different uh, tasks. Uh, I was also involved in uh, creating training pipelines. Also, as uh, Arnon says, uh, told you before, we use uh, LLMs to, for generating synthetic data such as uh, preparing uh, training data for fine-tuning uh, our LLMs, uh, as well as, uh, like for instance, uh, extracting some informations uh, by leveraging uh, LLMs. So, uh, and the most uh, interesting project that I have done is uh, being involved, involved in building a rag for our chatbot that uh, Arnon show, showed you uh, previously. So that's the projects that I were involved with. And now uh, I will uh, jump into a, a tutorial on rag, a basic tutorial, and uh, we'll uh, discuss some of the challenges uh, on building rag. Uh, that I have experienced and also uh, solutions in order to solve them. So I'm going to be presenting my screen. So you can see my screen, right? Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay. So uh, let us start by introduction to RAG. Uh, so why do we need RAG? Uh, so RAG is a technique that will enhance the capabilities of the LLMs to answer our questions uh, 
by incorporating some, uh, by giving them some knowledge source. And this is done by first retrieving uh, the necessary documents that are relevant to answer a question and uh, providing those as a context to the LLMs. So why do we need RAG? Why don't we use uh, LLMs uh, by providing the full document uh, or by providing the whole knowledge source to the LLMs? Or why don't we use, uh, why don't we find twin uh, an LLM for our specific use case and use that? So the reason why we need run RAG is, uh, first of all, LLMs are uh, trained by uh, public data sets uh, and it can, it, it excels at answering generic questions, but they are not specific to a specific domain uh, that we are interested in. So, uh, and also the data can be outdated. In that case, LLMs might have uh, trouble to answer our specific questions. Uh, so for LLMs to give, and another advantage is that uh, the LLMs need to understand the, their domain to provide a right answer. And uh, so what I meant is that, uh, for instance, uh, if we have a specific questions, and that specific questions can be answered by only uh, looking a relevant section section of uh, a knowledge source. But if we provided the whole knowledge source to the LLM, uh, it might lose its its focus and uh, might not provide a, a good result. Uh, and the uh, other, so, uh, and the other advantage is that uh, LLMs, uh, the other techniques that we can do is that to fine tune our LLM with uh, our specific uh, domain based uh, data set, but that would be uh, hard to do because it might be expensive in terms of infrastructure as well as uh, we need to have a, a very big data set in order to fine tune uh, an LLM for, for a specific domain. So an architectural uh, solution like RAG uh, would be an easier uh, solution to uh, enhance the capability of the LLM to answer uh, our specific question on a specific domain. So I think you are familiar with the RAG uh, architecture, so I'm going to skip this part. So basically you have two uh, uh, components. The first component is the retrieval components, uh, which will be responsible for uh, extracting, uh, extracting relevant sections of uh, relevant sections or documents from a knowledge source to answer our given question. And there is also the, gen the generation component, which will be responsible for generating uh, an answer to our question, given that uh, we provided the relevant documents that we extracted. So these are the two components, the retriever and the generator. So, uh, so the to see the architecture uh, for uh, for uh, some of you guys that might not be familiar with uh, RAG. So we have the query here, and uh, the first step would be to embed that query, uh, changing the query into an embedding vector, and then uh, uh, we will look for uh, we will uh, use things like uh, similarities, semantic similarity search in order to extract relevant documents from the from our database that holds our knowledge source. And that's going to be done by comparing the embedding vector of the query and uh, the, embedding, the embedding vectors of the documents that are in our uh, database. And then after retrieving the relevant documents, we will uh, 
we will include that in our prompt and uh, send it to an LLM like uh, maybe GPT uh, to generate an answer. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Just Daniel, I wanted to jump in just so that because this is a good, uh, a good graph, like a good place to show that agents could be used in a way that I think you you mentioned it in the retrieval sense. An agent would probably be there to be able to determine, for example, whether we extracted the right given a query that we can have an agent. Without an agent, we would not know when to stop, uh, whether we actually extracted. So this is one using agents, let's say, as a retrieval sense would be to really make sure that we have the relevant component. So it terminates only, like internally, it, it, it makes a decision until we find actually the right source. If there are confusions, it breaks it down until it finds, for example, explores the data in such a way that we get a good um, place or a, a good basically source and in the way that we want it. So format it also the, the, the extracted component in a, in a format that we want. So that's where, for example, one use of agent there just as, as a retrieval, so retrieval agent. And then you also mentioned about the generation. I think there you could also go and again, another agent would make sure with a skill of like answering or understanding users' intents and questions and now having a clear uh, document or a clear uh, context now we'll also answer it or format it with by conversing with the LLM to get the right um, answer or the, the right generation. And just I thought this is a good place to to contextualize, you know, okay. uh, how you could do, you could have different two agents, for example, that ensure this is mostly useful maybe for a high stake QA, like where you really need to get it. And you need to estimate actually even the accuracy um, and um, you know provide for example if it's a very sensitive thing you probably could could replace both the retrieval and the generation with rack just yeah but yeah, yeah. proceed I, I think uh, yeah uh, that's really an interesting use of uh, agents uh, in this architecture I'm not sure uh, also uh, like yeah we said maybe uh, having an agent that can review and validate the answer that was generated by uh, the generator agent maybe and uh, improving the quality of the answer might be also a use case uh, i think right if we have uh, different agents one agent might be reviewing an answer or it can also compare uh, if we have multiple generator agents one and it can compare the generated answers from multiple sources and also uh, come up with uh, a very good answer that might be also another use case uh, uh, Absolutely. I, I don't I, mean, have, I, I, yeah. I think that's a good case for sensitive and when you really need to get it yeah. correctly and um you know of course the cost increases but yeah for certain purposes this might be yeah. okay great so uh so uh the first part of the erag is the data because we need to prepare the or create our now knowledge source uh, that will be stored in the vector store so in this part the critical section that's uh we can uh we can configure or optimize might be the chunking strategy so why do we need first chunking it's because uh the documents need to be uh stored in a sectioned way because the whole point of a rag is that we don't need to provide the whole uh information to the llm uh, because the LLM has a uh, limit in token or uh, it might uh, lose its focus on answering, uh, on generating the right answer. So we need to uh, chunk the, our knowledge source into sections and provide it uh, and store it in the vector store. 
So that's why we need chunking, and uh, we can have a small size chunks or long uh, size, uh, long chunk sizes. So if we use a small chunk sizes, uh, it might it will lead to an accurate retrieval, uh, but not it might not provide the full context to the LLM because uh, the chunks might be uh, short. For instance, if we chunk in sentence level chunking. Then uh, we might we sometimes we might lose uh, we might uh, not give the whole the all the context that are needed to answer the question to the LLM. Uh, but in terms of accuracy, uh, it will yield a good accuracy because most of the time the query that users will provide are sh short in links and. When we do uh, si uh, similar, when we do comparison between uh, the chunks that are stored in the vector store and the query, if uh, the length of the query, the embedding, the embedding vector length of the query and the embedding vector of the chunks are comparable, then uh, it's uh, advantageous to extract relevant sections because our embedding similarity function will perform uh, very well but uh, for long size chunk sizes uh, they provide much better context to the llm but uh, the retrieval step that's based on the similarity search might not be accurate because we have a uh, usually short size uh, query queries and if our chunks are very long, the similarity search might not be accurate. And also, there might be noises or unwanted informations that are that will be sent to the LLM. So the question is, where can we compromise the two advantage? And from my experience, what we did on Lizzie is that we uh, in, we try we tested different chunking configuration and. We did an experiment, so uh, so what I would suggest for you is it might not uh, be convenient in terms of uh, the time that you have to deliver the project, but experiment uh, and evaluate different techniques and choose the one that uh, yields uh, best uh, a good result. That's the process that we took on Lizzie. So. There are different chunking strategies. Uh, so the first one might be uh, a simple chunking that, given a text, uh, a text con uh, document, it will try to break down the documents into chunks of a specified number of characters or specified number of tokens without any other uh, consideration. It is simple to do but it might not yield a good result. There is another chunking strategy called recursive chunking strategy uh, that uh, you can find uh, this implementation on Langchain. Uh, and in this method, uh, ethics would be first uh, chunk, uh, would be uh, separated into smaller chunks, then in a hierarchical way. Uh, what I mean by that is that first, uh, we will try to break down ethics into paragraphs and if the paragraphs uh, does not yield uh, the chunk size that we specified, for instance, if we want the chunk size to contain uh, 100 tokens, but the paragraphs uh, that were created are uh, very long, then for paragraphs that has a longer chunk size, they would be split into sentences and uh, also sentences would then be split into words if, if that does not yield the desired chunk size so in that way a uh, recursive chunking method will uh, chunk your document into chunks and this is implemented in Langchain. we have also a semantic chunking strategy this is also i think available in Langchain. and in this method uh, this method aims to group uh, similar chunks that uh, that are telling about uh, similar information into uh, into they will it will group them in together 
So by this will be done by uh, using a semantic relationship between chunks. The idea is to keep uh, similar chunks uh, together. And we have also structural chunking strategy for documents that has that have structure. For example, there is uh, HTML documents have tags, so we can use the HTML based chunking uh, for uh, splitting the HTML document into uh, different sections. So that's uh, for chunking strategy. Uh, let me skip this one and uh, let me move on to, I think, query expansion. So in order to improve the quality of the response, uh, we need to provide first, uh, we need to provide uh, for the LLM the most relevant documents or information that we extracted from our vector store uh, so that it can produce a very good answer. So just for the Navy implementation, it's very easy to implement a rack uh, that extracts uh, relevant documents based on similar search, then provide that relevant documents to the LLM. But the quality of the answer from this Navy implementation might not be uh, good. So there are different techniques in order to improve uh, that, we, which are called query expansions. So uh, the first query expansions uh, technique that we have is uh, query expansion with uh, hypothetical answer augmentation. So what this does is that, so one of the reasons that might, uh, for our retrieval, might not retrieve, retrieve relevant documents could be due to the fact that it's only considering the questions in order to search for similar documents, but not the expected answer. So uh, what we do in the query expansion with hypothetical answer augmentation method is that given the query, we first use, uh, uh, we will use, uh, we will send the query directly, directly to, the, to an LLM in order for the LLM to provide a hypothetical answer without giving it a context. So we will ask, uh, we will say, here is the question that I have. Uh, just provide me a hypothetical answer. It might not, it will not be a correct answer, but it will, uh, the answer will have the format that the, the true answer is going to have in the future. So. In, that, in such way, the, the LLM will produce a hypothetical answer. Then we will, we will augment this hypothetical answer with the query and uh, we will uh, send that to our vector store so, so that we to search relevant documents from the vector store. So in this way, the similarity, the similarity search that is based on the semantic uh, comparison is going to is going to consider the expected answer, the format of the expected answer, as well as the original question in order to really to retrieve relevant documents. So by this way, we can enhance the we can increase the confidence that we have in order uh, in that we have so that uh, the relevant documents that are necessary to answer will be extracted so that's the first query expansion method so just to summarize the steps we are going to have a query we will send that query first to uh, an llm then the llm is going to generate a hypothetical answer then we will uh, concatenate the hypothetical answer as well as the query and uh, send it to the retrieval. Then relevant documents are going to be uh, uh, returned from the retriever. Then we will send the relevant documents and the query to the actual uh, LLM that will be responsible for generating the answer. 
So this is one query expansion technique. The other query expansion technique is to, uh, to create multiple queries from, uh, from the query that was given by the user. So in this approach, given a query, we will ask the LLM to generate list of any queries that are related to the original query. And that will be helpful to answer, uh, to generate a very good answer to the original query. The goal here is to retrieve different topics that are important for answering our questions. So in this case, we, are, we have uh, a query that was provided by the user and we will create, by using an LLM, we will create uh, new queries, new questions that are related to this question uh, and uh, that might uh, touch different topics uh, that will help the LLM to answer, to generate uh, the right answer. So in this case, we have to make sure that the additional queries that are generated are not just a rephrasing of the original query, rather they must be asking the different uh, different questions that are related to the original question. So it will touch uh, the additional question should touch uh, topics that are related to the original query, but it might it should not be a simple rephrase rephrase of the original query. So that's the other technique that we have. And uh, we have also other techniques, uh, like for instance, uh, we might uh, we might split a question into different sub queries. So, given a query, we 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 might uh, use an LLM to uh, generate a sub queries uh, from the query. This will be helpful for cases like. If the question is very long and complicated, we will uh, we will split it into uh, simple subqueries, and for each subquery, we will uh, try to retrieve documents, and uh, then we will combine those documents, uh, select uh, the most appropriate documents to answer our question, and send that to LLM. Uh, that's not uh, presented in the slide, but we can use also uh, this technique. Uh, there is also another technique, uh, which is to use uh, a keyword uh, searching method in the retrieval. So uh, the till now, what I discussed was a search for relevant documents based on semantic search by comparing the semantic similarity between the question and the, the, the question and the documents that are stored in the vector store. But we can also use a, a keyword searching method that is uh, by selecting uh, chunks or documents that has uh, keywords which are also included on the original question. So Langchain has, for example, a, a retriever that works based on keyword searching, which is called BM25 retriever. So you can also experiment with that. So uh, from my experience in Lizzy, uh, we have, uh, what we did is that we tested each uh, query expansion techniques. So we created uh, retrievers that implements the different query expansion techniques. And we try to evaluate them in order to uh, select the best retriever. So we also try to combine different retrievers. For example, one retriever might use uh, a, a query expansion based on hypothetical answer augmentation. Another retriever might use uh, a keyword searching method and another, expand, uh, another retriever might, might use uh, 
multiple query expansion method, then try to combine them in an ensemble way, and uh, so that uh, we will have uh, more probability to fetch or extract relevant documents. This will be useful for cases like, for example, some uh, questions in order to retrieve documents for some certain type of questions, keyword searching method might be uh, very good. But for other type of questions, maybe uh, a simple semantic search uh, retrieving method might be useful. So in combining uh, different retrievers, retrievers in a hybrid way, uh, we are going to uh, increase our chance of getting uh, getting all the relevant documents that are necessary uh, to answer a question. The precisions, the noise or the precision might be uh, might be lower because if we are using multiple re retrievers in a hybrid way, uh, the number of documents that are going to be uh, extracted from the vector store is going to be uh, very large and it might, uh, we we might have uh, noises, but there is a way to re-rank them and select the top K relevant documents uh, from list of documents that are selected uh, by our hybrid uh, retriever. So this way it can, you can increase the quality of the, the quality of the rack. So what I would suggest is to experiment and evaluate uh, different techniques and select the one that works for you. Uh, in terms of time, uh, when you use uh, multiple retrievers as well as uh, query expansion techniques that involve uh, calls to an LLM, the time to, uh, to respond might, uh, might be slow. And as you know, chatbots should be should have an experience so that the user can feel uh, the answers are generated in, in real time. So for that, uh, use for instance, use a different uh, parallel programming methods like multi-trading. Or uh, I would also suggest if you are using LangChain, I would suggest you to use the ans the async methods that LangChain provides. For example, for embedding operation, LangChain has uh, a sync implementation and also a sync implementation. So uh, you have to use all, you have to make sure that all the operations that you use from the LangChain are async. Uh, and uh, you will see an increase in the speed. So yeah, I, I think uh, that's all I have to say. Uh, Wonderful. I think this was really great, Daniel. Um, any questions from I think you have shared already the slides, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr, you, yeah, you can. Sometimes audio. Hello. Hello. Hi. 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 Can, yeah. can you hear me? We can hear. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, the tutorial. Yeah. So, I th I I think uh, from from what I I'm seeing, uh, the the first thing would be the the query part or uh, the the data we get or the query the vector store depends uh, much on how, how much context we give to the llm depends on the vector database query right so so like there are different types of uh, asking the vector store so from Lizzie AI, what what did you 
guys implement and why from the query transformation part yeah okay so uh i'm not uh quite sure if your question was related to uh the operations that is responsible for searching relevant documents uh meaning uh, the operations that we selected for uh the comparison between the query and the documents or are you ask, asking the query expansion techniques uh, uh so just to answer the two of them uh so uh for computing uh, the or for comparing the que the question and the uh, chunks, uh, I think we are using cosine similarity. Uh, there are also other similarity uh, operations for uh, semantic search, but most of them has uh, similar result results. So uh, I think you are go good to go with cosine similarity. Type. Uh, cosine and similarity uh, operation and you don't have to worry that much on uh, on that because most of the similarity function uh, have the have similar results but for the type of retriever that we use at lazy uh, as I told you before uh, we combined uh, multiple retrievers so we have uh, a keyword search retriever uh, which is based on uh, bm25 i guess and also uh, we have retrievers retrievers that implements uh, uh, different qu query expansion techniques that uh, i described earlier so uh, I would suggest for you also to try to uh, experiment on those uh, by uh, combining uh, different by first by creating retrievers that implements different query expansion techniques and then uh, try to combine those uh, retrievers and evaluate your rack then select the one that best works for you. So uh, instead of just uh, telling what we are using at Lizzie, I just wanted for you to also experiment on that and uh, select the best combination. That's why. Hello. Okay. Uh, okay. Sh shall I add on to that question? Yeah, yeah. 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 You can add. Okay. So uh, I'm a little bit uh, uh, being ambiguous or confused <laughs> on uh, what you mean by query. Uh, expansion expansion yeah expansion okay. and the difference between query expansion and query translation from from what i what i'm seeing or what i know previously is that there is the first step is like query translation so there is different types of query translations like id or uh, rock fusion or something so do you mean that or are those different things or and if these are different like can we implement them on yeah, yeah. So, so those are also uh, so that's a term confusion i think so those are also uh, query expansion techniques that, that means okay you can call it query transformation uh, converting your your query to another query that might be done by uh, expanding the query uh, by generating multiple question or by augmenting hypo, uh, hypothetical answer or by using different techniques. The main idea is to transform your query to another query. So the, uh, the, the techniques that you also mentioned uh, serves the, also uh, the same function. So you just, use the techniques that you know and uh, evaluate them and try uh, to select uh, the one that works best for you 
And uh, I would suggest also to combine different retrievers uh, that implements uh, different techniques and uh, see the results. Uh, so, sorry to add on to that. So can we, um, I'm thinking of like, uh, can we implement those translation or one or two of those translation in a single, for example, in our challenge only to implement two of them? Or can we just augment two of them? So, so okay. for instance, in LangChain, uh, there is a retriever called Insemble. So the Insemble retriever can accept multiple retrievers. So, uh, for instance, one retriever might uh, implement uh, one enhancing query transformation technique, another retriever might use uh, an, another query expansion technique, then you are going to have two re retrievers and you will uh, combine them in an ensemble retriever. And in, su in such a way, uh, you will see a combined result. Uh, did I answer your question? On or did I confuse you more? Oh, no, uh, it's, it's really great. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so my my other uh, question adding on to that would be uh, like for embedding part. I, I, I think maybe I missed uh, some of the some of your presentation. I apologize for that. So about the embedding part so it like there are different types of embedding i know i have we have to experiment and we we will do that so i'm um, actually ha i have a question on the types of embedding for example if the embedding is much more curated for the data we have there is a saying that uh, we can actually have a a, a good uh, retrieval so What's your take on that? I think maybe a little bit expand on those. Okay, so actually the open source embedding model that are out there, uh, for instance, that is, uh, uh, you can use open AI embedding models and uh, uh, it will work for you. Uh, to have a specific uh, domain-based model, you need to fine-tune uh, an embedding model, which is going, uh, which is going to be a bit, uh, uh, a bit expensive in terms of the time that you have for this project. So you just use the open-source uh, embedding models that are out there. Okay, thank you. Um, just, just uh, in this case. We are, we are providing mostly the OpenAI, which is works quite well as well. And if you want to compare different embeddings within OpenAI, for example, the ADA one, which was actually the one of the best in its time. Now it's not anymore, maybe. And especially now the uh, vectorizer small and large is actually good as well. So you can compare how much even improvement there is or what are the you know the different embedding techniques could be within that of course you are very free and encouraged as well to be able to explore open source ones for example um you could you could have bert and variants of it as a an embedder so just some of them they might not off the shelf they might not support sentence transformation so you have to do some I mean, I think Tibert or uh, like that, you you could use them for sentence transformation or sentence embedding. But in general, yes, that's what we provide just to, to make it easy and also to experiment with the state of the art uh, embedders are the ones OpenAI. But feel free to experiment with others. Actually encouraged. So it's more to. Yeah. Actually, when I say also open, AI, uh, open source, I mean to say embedding models that uh, are provided by uh, uh, by services like OpenAI. Uh, so uh, the open AI embedding models, as Yavi said, will work well for you. 
so uh, sorry uh, on the vector search part i th i think you mentioned B you're using you guys are using bm25 or other did i miss misheard that so the bm25 is a keyword uh yeah retriever so yeah we also include that uh, so uh i would say uh for you also to test that or uh, to check that okay, okay. Thank so, you. so just maybe maybe to add if you are using you know some of the vector databases like for example a wave it and and may and others you will be able to just do this very like they provide that quickly right so you don't have to implement much you could just basically once you get the data in wave it for example you'll be able to have hybrid uh, dense and uh, as well as just keyword so by keyword just totally keyword or a combination of keyword and uh, vector or vector so i think as i explained last time vector just only vector search is only dense vector plus keyword is uh, hybrid and keyword is called sparse so just uh, how about bm25 uh, it's just that's, uh, keyword. So that's keyword. Keyword. so bm25 or variants of it there are many it's everything that is just they're all built out of tf idf type of uh, i mean keyword search with some weights okay okay i had a confusion between keyword and bm25 that's why no you. it's all of them are similar yeah it's like just I, that's why it's sometimes for a, a com you can use words like sparse, hybrid, or uh, dense. In that sense, you categorize all the types. So without and ev most of the everything that ha that doesn't involve vector is called keyword, and everything that involves totally vectors is just a dense, and a combination is uh, hybrid. Okay, so uh, you mentioned Revit. I I haven't heard of it. Revit. Can you Revit. can you spell it out for us? Revit, with it. So I mean, I, I, okay, I, I with it. it. Oh, okay, thank you. But you can use it in any in all of the vector databases. You can get. So. Okay, fantastic, uh, Hillary. You have a question? Yes. Um, so my uh, my question is, first of all, first on the we have an evaluation set so use for uh with ragas so um like uh, it, you you mentioned that you can use different re retrievers or different met uh, methods uh and have re different maybe retrievers so how can you like is there a way to automate that so let's say we have long chain the the chain you can you can come up with a, a pipeline for rag for the using long chain so can that work if you want to test different retrievers on the evaluation set because i believe with the evaluation set you have the answer but you also have to generate a, a, an answer using that specific retriever and and on the second question is uh you mentioned about hypothetical answer so there's uh, i some i researched and i i found out hide hypothetical document embeddings uh, I'm asking if that is the the same that is the same the same uh, concept or it's a different one that comes up with like uh, different embeddings the way we pass the embeddings to chroma or uh, another vector store. so is so, that uh, the case or is it a different method so I think it is a similar uh, method so uh, I also have seen that on, uh, I've also seen that, but uh, at Lizzy we implemented our own uh, hypothetical answer augmentation, but Hyde is uh, also serving the same function, uh, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and uh, for your first question, uh, so create a pipeline that can be easily configurable. So for instance, uh, your pipeline might 
accept uh, the type of retrievers that it will use or the type of checking strategies it will use. You, and then uh, automate that so that uh, you can test uh, the different configuration of your rag. For instance, one uh, rag might use diff some specific chunk strategy, another rank might use another specific chunk strategy, and then uh, use ragas uh, to evaluate uh, those rags. And then the idea is, the main goal is to, for you to, to select or for you to choose uh, the best rag. So that will, uh, that will generate a very good quality answer. That's the idea behind evaluating your rag and also uh, testing uh, different chunk strategies or different query transformation technique. The main goal is for you to have uh, a good quality answer being generated. And okay. in the data set, there is a question and the ground truth answer. Uh, you also have, uh, you are going also to have the answer that's generated by the rack, as well as the context, meaning the retrieved documents uh, from the retriever. So using those uh, items, you can use maybe ragas or any other uh, rag evaluation techniques in order to evaluate your rack and select the best that one works for you. But keep in mind that the main goal of this process is for you to select uh, a very good rack. Wonderful. Thank you, Daniel. And I think this was really in hopefully useful for everyone, learned many things, and the project is clear. And thanks to uh, Daniel and Arnon, they made it very clear on what is actually the business objective as well. So, but just before we close, Adisu has a hand, but let's make it short because we are way over time. Adisu. Am I the best? Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, when we do the chunking part, uh, the chunking part, uh, are we just focusing on the two documents or are we going to build for the general? Or maybe uh, other documents also, or uh, because uh, I was confused if uh, we are going to use some chunking for the one type of document, maybe it's not a good idea for another documents. So are we thinking only for the two documents? Okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, so the domain uh, for this challenge is going to be on contracts and. Most of the contracts that will be using your chatbots is going to have a similar uh, kind of structure. So most of the contracts are going to have are going to be similar documents. So the chunk strategies that you will use, you are going to use, is going to be a generic uh, chunk strategy for legal contracts. So it's not going to be dynamic based on the contract documents that's uploaded on your chatbot. Uh, so I think, that's, that's, yeah, I think that's a very good and clean question answer. And like, and, and so maybe just at this, if you meant whether, so there are, for your question, there are two ways. One is exactly what Daniel answers, if you, if you meant do you have to optimize just only for these two or for others? I think Daniel answered, no. In principle, it should work for everything. So it's for every contract type. And then there is another component to your question, whether it's like in the machine learning sense, we don't, we don't want to overfit. That means when we evaluate, you know, which one we use for uh, validation and which one you, we use for test. So if you meant, should we use everything, one document as a validation and one document as a test, or can we use something else as a validation and then use this as a test? That's another question. I think if, I don't know if you have other documents, uh, contract type, but if you can find other contract types, or I think we provided something, um, I think policies at least, you could use them as a validation and then 
use these for tests. But when they are very different documents, maybe it might be slightly uh, suboptimal. But so I don't know which which you mean. Maybe explain it so that Daniel can also add. Yeah, yeah it was the first questions. one. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it was the first one. Uh, oh, Daniel answered. Uh, okay. Thank Fantastic. you so much. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, everyone. Was